Well, thanks for choosing this uh, room. I'm sure there are three other interesting lectures. Um, so I'll start with, a, first of all, the title, uh, Short Afternoon Adventure Down Memory Lane. I'll soon introduce myself. But um, I first wanted to start with a, one of my favorite quotes. Um, it's a dangerous business Frodo uh, going out your door. Uh, Bilbo Baggins uh, told him that in the beginning of uh, Lord of the Rings. I'll just grab this. So, uh, some interesting things about myself. I got my first PC when I was uh, in the third grade. It was a ZX Spectrum, so that can date me to the 80s. I was born in 75. <laughs> I uh, graduated from the Hebrew University in 96, then I dropped out twice um, over in some gap from both Weizmann and uh, uh, Technion, uh, the MSC. Um, what else? I've been developing formal uh, verification software for the past 20 years, most of it from in for Intel. Now I'm a, a manager at Cadence. And uh, the most important thing, I, I, that's my ID of choice, Vim and Tmux. I can't get used to the modern stuff. <laughs> it's just too slow, I I'm sorry. Um, and uh, yeah, I still have programming after all these years. Okay, so we'll talk about what brought me to this uh, motivating problem. Um, and uh, what it, are the prescribed solutions to, to solve it. And then how I uh, found it more fun to, to actually solve. Um, introducing the scope te template. Um, also, what other things we can do with it. And um, obviously it's not perfect and, and it, it can have some uh, drawbacks, so we'll talk about them, as well as how I try to sort of uh, solve them, and then do a summary. Okay, so it started with a problem at work. Uh, we have a uh, infrastructure of uh, computational software. There is a graph data structure at the bottom and it's shared between two threads through many, many APIs. And the problem is the, that these two threads want to use the, the graph in different ways, so there are thresholds for the amount of computation for the GUI thread versus the uh, kind of business thread or the um, scripting thread. So the question is, how do we pass different thresholds um, from, from through all these layers in a thread-safe way? Um, Okay, and, and, and the problem obviously is of how do you lock it, how do you maintain the state, so there are prescribed solutions. One of them is to configure the graph data structure directly with some APIs, but then you have to uh, make sure that it's thread safe, you maintain the state, you set and reset it correctly. Um, another kind of more sophisticated way is doing a view of the, uh, of the model, underlying model for each thread, but then you need to synchronize them, so um, it's, it's harder to maintain um, and more complex. And finally, you can pass arguments, which is kind of simple, but it's, um, it has two problems. You have to pass them almost everywhere, and it also litters your code with low-level details, so uh, you might have reasons not to do that. So all these, all these solutions, I guess they're good, and, and, and you can adapt them to your needs, but What's the fun in that, right? So I, I promised an adventure. Um, so the scope template. Basically, uh, it's, it's a template that wraps a type, type T. And uh, so you can wrap an integer, but it has a semantics. So this integer might be a threshold or a height or like X axis or whatever. So using uh, some extra uh, type class tags, uh, you can differentiate them. So for instance, here, uh, we're defining a scoped threshold, which is an integer. And you must put them on the stack, or at least uh, they need to appear as if they are on the stack. They, they need to kind of uh, construct and destruct in a stack manner. So you can also put them in a container. OK, so what it is is basically a uh, linked list, or a doubly linked list, which is embedded within the stack. Um, each template has its own uh, linked list, or each template instance. And uh, it uses thread local uh, pointers to point to the beginning and ending of the, of the stack. 
So basically, each thread sees a different instance of this linked list. And uh, for instance, here there are three functions calling each other. F1 calls F2, which calls F3. And we instantiated a threshold in uh, both F1 and F2. And what is built here is uh, an embedding of these uh, uh, scope values in the different uh, frames along the stack. So you can reach from the top to the kind of top of the stack here. It's sorry. Here it's uh, threshold 60. And the next um, item is threshold 30. So it, in effect, skips the frame. So that's kind of not interesting for the um, scope variables. So uh, let's show you some um, uh, state of the art animation. Um, so uh, we're going to debug this a little to see what's going on. Uh, we're entering the main, and there is a uh, scope within the main. And initially, the top and bottom pointers are empty. Then we instantiated a, thresh, a scope threshold and um, here. So now the top points to it, and the next again points to the null, and the other way around from the bottom. And I'm going to skip the first print number, it's going to print 3, and go into the next one, print 10. So now when it goes into 10, it looks for some instantiated um, uh, scope threshold. So it asks for this uh, scope threshold top, which is a static uh, function. And it's thread local in the sense that it goes to the local. Uh, the function is not thread local, but it uses thread local data. So it goes to this top and finds this guy, which was instantiated here, um, reaches for its value, and then, then it sees that the number t uh, 10 is larger than the threshold, and it will print that it is big. Uh, going out, I'm finishing the scope, and now this is going to disappear, and the pointer is going back to the original uh, state, where they point to null, and the next time around, basically I'm going to um, not enter this uh, if statement, and just print that the number is 10, so the threshold is gone. So this is basically it. Um, and now let's see what, what else we can uh, do about it, or do with it. So, uh, one example is caching. Many computation software um, enjoy caching, right? You don't want to compute the same thing over and over. The problem with caching is that when you develop a computational library, you don't always know when is the best kind of time to uh, install a cache and, and maybe clear it. And it's usually determined or best determined by whoever is using you. So it's the consumer of your model. And with, with a scoped uh, solution, you can do it quite uh, flexibly. Um, in this example, we're computing is prime. It's really simple. So is prime uh, determines whether a number is a prime. And uh, you want to cache the result, whether it's true or false, you still want to cache it. So we define a scope prime cache. And the value here is an unordered map from integer um, to a Boolean, whether it's, scope, whether it's prime or not. Um, and here, basically what we do is uh, inside is prime, we're looking for an instantiated, uh, th uh, not threshold, <laughs> cache. But, but um, in the previous example, we looked at the top of the stack. Here we're looking at the bottom of the stack. And this is a semantical choice, basically, uh, for cache. It makes sense to, to take the, the largest cache. Um, and and uh, the reason we're using the bottom. And again, we're just uh, picking the value from it, which is the cache itself, and then looking whether something is in the cache and returning it, and so on and so forth. And later, if it's not, um, we're doing the calculation and, again, inserting the result into the cache. OK. Um, there are some intermediate functions, like next prime, which is uh, getting a number and then looks for the next prime number using is prime. And also uh, first n primes, which is using next primes. Both are totally unaware of caching. So, so that's, you might like it or not, but, but it's, it's a feature in this sense. So, so they have no idea that caching is going on. And then in the main, you basically install a cache and call your API. And here, it calculates the first n primes. And the next time around, when it calculates the first 10 primes, five out of those are going to be cache hits. And you can decide, so, so think about maybe you want to install a default cache inside your API, 
but lets the user um, set a larger cache if they want. So this usage of uh, nested caches is uh, useful. Okay, um, next example, event counting. Yeah, so event counting. Uh, this is useful when, for, for a few use cases. So one is debugging. You have a library that has many operations and you want to see um, how many times an, an operation is happening within some sc uh, scope, either for debug or performance, and also uh, maybe you want to see how many times a user uh, test is using your API. So think of a histogram of your uh, APIs. This, this could even support marketing. Um, so questions like how many times did an event of type X happen within scope Y or within some computation? So we'll show an example of a simple calculator. Um, so this calculator, you just see the top of it. It has four operations. And within it, I uh, declared a subclass called counter. And basically, it's a histogram of, of uh, operations. So each time uh, you, uh, you use some add or uh, subtract, it will increment it, and then uh, be able to report the histogram. So we define this alias, scoped counter, which is a scoped counter. And then within the calculator itself, uh, from each kind of different operation, we're going to call uh, increment. And increment will basically look for an instantiated counter. Well, actually, it looks for all instantiated counters. And it will loop through them. So think about uh, you want to do nested counting on multiple levels. And you want, I'll show it in a second, but uh, it's not just one thing that you're instantiating, but a whole stack of them. So for each one, I'm going to increment, say, add um, in the stack. And in this example, we have basically a simple nesting. We have the main function, which instantiated uh, an outer counter. And uh, it computes an average and, and computes other stuff like uh, the meaning of life, which is uh, 2 times 3 times 7. Um, and um, uh, inside the average, there is another uh, instantiated scope counter, so you can get this nested report. Okay, finally, and I think the most interesting, uh, uh, the, the most interesting example, um, we, we mentioned threads, but we didn't see them yet. So uh, this is a decorator. Uh, I took a simple decorator. So you have here a text decorator, which takes a string and basically manipulates it in different ways. And uh, decorators are, are uh, polymorphic by nature. You have an abstract decorator and you have instantiations. And you want to apply them on top of each other. Now, uh, the scope library is polymorphic, or it supports polymorphism. And they actually kind of lied a bit at the beginning. Scoped is not a template. Scoped is an alias. And the, the real template is, is two. Uh, one is the abstract scope, which uh, declare the, the top kind of the abstract uh, um, uh, the abstract type that you're uh, scoping and then polymorphic scope is for each child so a scoped is basically an alias to a polymorphic scope that uh, has the same type for the child for the base class and the child class okay so here um, we have a logging function it's really simple uh, but it's going to be used by two threads and it looks for, it gets a text message, and then it wants to decorate it. So basically, it goes um, in the direction of the stack from top to bottom, looking for decorators along the stack, and then uh, applying each and every decoration to the original message. Now, because these are um, uh, thread specific, you don't need to worry about thread safety. So it's going to decorate them uh, correctly. And the only um, kind of locking here uh, or synchronization is in the printing itself. So um, here we have uh, two threads. Yeah, so here we have two threads. One uh, is uh, just turning the text into uppercase, and the other is both turning the text into uh, uh, lowercase and indenting it. And uh, it's going in a loop and uh, kind of uh, interleave kind of loop and, and, and print with sleeps and, and printing them. So you're going to see something like this. Uh, thread one messages interleave with thread two messages. You can see that this is uppercased and this is both lowercased and indented. 
Okay. Okay, drawbacks and an attempt to um, overcome them. Okay. Anybody know, uh, heard of this quote? I really love this quote, and the reason I love it is that I made it up. Um, so, a uh, good adventure must have a few dragons. So, I, I, I guess some people might not, not like this idea, but I wanted to hear it kind of, uh, not guess, but really <laughs> hear people's thoughts of it. So, I went to the deep forest of uh, subreddit programming, and um, I got some uh, replies. So, uh, one told me that it was, quote, interesting. And native English speakers, uh, when they say something is interesting, especially in italics, not necessarily a positive thing. Um, <laughs> uh, someone said that, uh, I have my doubts if such implicit argument passing is a good idea. Um, racket, I don't, I don't know what racket is, uh, <laughs> has a feature called parameters that is like this. This worries me though. Um, and the best one was how to make data flow analysis frustrating and hard to debug. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so, so I thought, okay, fine, let's, let's try to do something about it. So I had a couple of ideas. They're not solve answering, they're not slaying the dragons, okay? They, they're just kind of uh, maybe uh, appeasing them with some food. <laughs> um, so the first one is a shield. So what the shield does is it protects your scope from external effects. And very simply, when you instantiate a shield in your scope, it will uh, turn the, the top and bottom uh, pointers to null, keep the original ones, and when it goes out of scope, it returns them. So it basically erases the previous uh, um, uh, kind of stack for, for the current scope. And this is useful for a bunch of things like debugging or you know, isolating your, your problematic code or scopes that require special attention, like, okay, in this calculation, I want to make sure that something happens. I think the best reason uh, to use it is that uh, I trust my own code to use scope, but I don't want any external effects from my users. Uh, of course, there are other things you can do, like uh, define your types as, as private, but, but this is another way to do it. So in this threshold example, um, Again, it prints the number, here uh, it prints three, here it prints big, and here I'm shielding this scope with a shield. So uh, 10 will not see the threshold above it and will, will print 10. Of course, I can instantiate new thresholds within this scope after I've shielded it from external ones. Um, okay, the next idea, which is a little more ambitious, is a manifest. So one of the problems with scoped is that it kind of provides an implicit API. <laughs> So these are hidden knobs, which you don't really see. Um, so what I tried to do, I know macros are, are the devil, but I use them lightly. <laughs> so what I tried to do is um, basically have the user define a structure containing the, the scope types, and then allow a way to attach this structure to different objects like, well, classes, methods, or functions. I'll show just a simple idea. So basically you have here uh, a few uh, macros one is to define the, uh, uh, or basically attach the, the, those manifest to your objects, and then to get them, to retrieve them. Retrieve them. In this example, um, there's this uh, get number function, again, similar to the previous one with a threshold, returns minus one if your number is larger than the threshold. And, but the difference is, is that it works with a manifest. So what the user does, or the programmer does, is uh, define a structure with the uh, types they want, like threshold here. And uh, uh, I forward declare the, the function, and then this macro basically attaches this structure to this function. So this is the manifest of get number. And later in get number, I can do like a scope get, get function manifest and it will return the correct structure. So from there, I pick threshold and top. So this is a way of, of attaching it. It's, it's not, it doesn't go all the way, I admit, but it's a, it's a step forward. And externally, I do the same. So basically, in main, I want to use get number, so I look for its manifest and, and use its uh, scope stuff. Um, and, and again, there is responsibility on the user to, to, to do it correctly, so, so I admit it's not a full solution. Um, but it was interesting using uh, type traits to, to implement this. Okay, summary. Um, so, uh, pros and cons. Uh, 
the scope stuff, it's, it's flexible, it's thread safe, uh, it's fast. Um, you don't need to worry about the configuration, kind of setting, resetting. It hides uh, low level details from your um, uh, header files. It's polymorphic. You can easily apply it to existing code. Um, uh, blah, blah, blah. I won't read it. I'm just running out of time. But the cons are that you're providing hidden knobs or a side channel. Manifest try to help. Um, it's also cone, uh, well, uh, it's prone to external effects if you don't do it correctly. Shields, shields could help. Um, and yeah, it gives me just an, it could give, give you another way to do some bad coding, which is always the case. And never, 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 ever use it instead of proper arguments. Like if you want to compute uh, um, a Pythagorean kind of sum of two numbers, pass these numbers, don't use scope. <laughs> um, so, the real summary is that we had a short adventure combining stacks with thread local data and templates. I, I really enjoy kind of bending the rules from time to time and kind of checking your implicit assumptions about the world, and in this case, C++. Um, experimenting is fun it's, and it's educating. It's really good to get feedback, even uh, it could be harsh. Um, so Reddit is a good place for that. And I hope to leave you with some questions, like in what other way can, can like prog or code no data? We're used to thinking in very kind of strict categories. Um, can com some complex design patterns be simplified if we change some underlying assumptions that we kind of take for granted? Um, what other features can we combine to create new ideas? And in general, what untraveled paths are left to explore? If you would like to uh, play with this scope, I open source it. So there's a QR code here. Um, that's it. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Do we have time for questions? Or? Are there questions? Yeah. Um, Come here. <laughs> yeah, it's a really cool talk. Thank you for it. Thank you. Uh, we used something similar on work in the past, and I actually wrote something on my own I'm going to show you later, which is very cool. similar. One of the differences I've seen is you mentioned you use a doubly linked list, right? What I've done is actually have like a thread local stack, and you can customize the maximum depth uh, to compile time and things like that. Mm. I was wondering, have you checked? the generated assembly, the overhead of accessing this, this scoped sort of like context. For example, you might imagine if you're doing metrics and logging, you want mm. it to be as transparent as possible in terms of the performance overhead they might have. So have you done anything on uh, that mm. sort of benchmark? In short, no. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's not kind of the first iteration. Well, I, I mostly wrote this thing for the talk, but um, uh, what I tried at first was actually using a real stack or a real data co collection. And I, then I figured, what for? We already have a stack, so let's just use that one. So the only thing that we're maintaining here is pointers. So in that sense, it, it relies on the, uh, on the compiler. Now, I did test it sort of like benchmarking against like passing arguments. Passing arguments is faster because they do tail recursion and so on and so forth if, if they can. But it's quite fast. Any other questions? Yeah? Does this be used for implementing aspects where you can effectively load what you want a particular function to do uh, by placing it in this and then having each function to say whatever aspect I'm supposed to be doing, do it here? That's a great question. Uh, I know what aspects are. I haven't kind of uh, dirtied my hands with it. Uh, I'm missing an ingredient here, which is a sort of reflection to actually use this, this. Yeah, so you can install data for aspects to use, but you need some some sort of reflection to actually do something with it before each before, you know, entry and exit of a function call. So maybe it's part of a solution. Oh, sure, sure. So, so let's say uh, this is instead of variable names, uh, like instead of this is the equivalent of parameter names or name parameters. So say you have this, this uh, 
uh, you want to configure it with different integers with different semantics. So one is a threshold, and another is, I don't know, maximum something, and another is a color, and they're all integers. So that's used for that, semantics. More questions? Okay, thanks a lot. I enjoyed it. Hope you did too.